Well, grab your Bibles, and I want you to turn with me to Romans chapter 10. That's your New Testament. Just keep going right. You'll get to the book of Romans, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, then Romans. Go to chapter 10, and I want you to go to verse 6. Uh, in 1876, the, um, the, the city of Philadelphia held its centennial celebration. Uh, of course, there was buildings and all these things they had to prepare to, to get it ready. And one of the things they had to do was landscape uh, the gardens and do everything that they needed to do. And so they decided to import this plant that was fast growing, that would uh, create some ground cover, that would stop erosion, that would be good for foraging. And so they imported a plant from Japan called kudzu. Some of you have heard this. Uh, kudzu is affectionately referred to by Southern people as the plant that ate the South. Uh, you can drive in Alabama and Virginia and West Virginia and all these places, and you can see literally a plant that has grown over everything. Like it overtakes massive trees. It chokes out the sunlight. So if you wanted to see what was there, you'd have to pull back the vines to get to the origin, to get to what's really going on underneath that plant because this foreign, outside, invasive species is overtaking uh, the, 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 the actual uh, true growth shit that should be happening there. Now, uh, you might guess, I, I, I want to I analogize that to something we're doing this morning. I want you to see that we're going to have to pull back some layers of tradition this morning. We're going to have to pull back some things. There's been some things that have grown up over genuine Christianity that if we're going to see it, it's invaded. It's, it's, it's in perhaps in some ways choked out what should really be there. And I want to pull back that a little bit and look underneath and see what, what should we really be seeing, Okay. So we're in this series, Travis just said, we're looking at this sort of what it means to be rooted in the gospel, and we really just want to answer two questions over these four weeks. How do you get rooted? And then what happens? Like, what's the result of being rooted? Okay, and we'll look at that in the next couple of weeks. But we, last week we started, and we said, well, the first in the, in the how, in the, the way that, that, that we get into the gospel, we get rooted in the gospel, is we first, we repent. We get this from Mark chapter 1, verse 15, and other places where Jesus comes into Galilee, preaching the kingdom, and and says, the kingdom of God is at hand, repent and believe the gospel. And so we said repentance is, man, have you felt a genuine sorrow for your sin? Right? Have you turned from that sin? And have you turned in obedience to God? Has there been a change of mind, like a, a real change of mind about who God is, who you are, and the way of salvation? Have you repented? But today we want to look at the other part of what Jesus says, where he says, believe the gospel. This is the second part of what we must do. We must believe in the gospel in order to be saved. Specifically, we must confess and believe the gospel. And to do that, we're going to look at Romans chapter 10, starting in verse 6. Okay, so let me just read verses 6 through 10, and we're going to kind of go back through and really focus in on one portion of this, all right? Romans chapter 10, verses 6 through 10. But the righteousness based on faith says, do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven or who will descend into the abyss that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, with the mouth one confesses uh, and is saved. Now, let me give you a little background of what Paul's doing here. Paul, of course, Romans is just this wonderful expansion of the gospel. But in this section of Romans, he's really kind of combating a philosophy, an understanding of how do you get right with God. And specifically, he's countering a Jewish notion, which, by the way, is just a religious notion that says that the way that you get right with God is, is this meticulous obedience to the law. That's what the Jews would have done. And Paul's going to say early in chapter 10, he's going to say, man, I commend them for their zeal. Like, these are zealous people who really want to be right with God. And that's a, good, that's, a, that's a good kind of zeal. The problem is it doesn't get them where they wanted to go. They think if they obey the law, they think if they're, they're you know, obedient in this way, they can be right with God. Paul says they've tried that. They've tried keeping the Old Testament law, and it doesn't make them right before God. Rather, Paul says, look at, look at I, I didn't read this to you, but go, go up to verse 3. 
And he says, talking about the Jews, he says, for being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. So he's saying basically the only way to be right before God is through believing, through faith in the perfect work, right? The, 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 the perfection of Christ and his work on our behalf. If that happens, right, then, then, then you're a Christian. So he says, look, there's it's the end, Christ is the end of all the attempts to work for your righteousness. Now he's going to keep expanding on that. Look at verse 6 and 7. He says, the righteousness, the, the righteousness based on faith says, do not say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven? That is to bring Christ down. Or who will descend to the abyss? That is to bring Christ up from the dead. In other words, basically Paul's just saying this. Real faith doesn't look and say, I can ascend the heights to pull Christ down to me. I can plumb the depths to bring Christ up to me. In other words, it doesn't work for it. It doesn't earn it. You cannot earn this faith. This is, there's some other way. So God isn't found in a pilgrimage to the mountaintop. He's not found by burying, un, unburying treasure deep in the earth. He, you, you can't bring through your own effort Christ to you. That's what he's saying. And so, so what happens instead? Well, again, look at, look at verse 8. He says, but what does it say? It doesn't say do these things. It says the word is near you, in your mouth, and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. So here's what Paul's saying. This is amazing. Everything we need, everything we need for right standing before God comes through the gospel. You just must believe it. This is the word of faith. But don't confuse that. It's not word of faith movement. He's saying this is the word of the gospel. You hear that. You believe that. And this is what will give you assurance. So now he's saying, hey, Roman Christians. Hey, Church Foothill Church in Glendora. You can rest assured that if you have believed the gospel that Paul, that the word of God preaches to you, if you believe that in your heart and you confess it with your, you're openly confessing Christ as Lord, and man, you, you don't need the mountaintop. You don't need the buried treasure. You have all the gospel that you need. It's wonderful. Now, what are you looking to? So, I mean, this is really a big question. And I, again, I told you last week, I'll tell you this week. I, I don't know hearts. I didn't think of anybody when we designed this series. I wasn't thinking, oh, that person thinks they're a Christian, but they're not. I, I'm, I'm literally, I want to speak to my own heart. What, Chris, am I putting my confidence in when it comes to my faith? What am I basing my life on? What am I looking to, to prove to myself that I'm right before God? What are you doing? What is it that you look to and say, man, this is what tells me I'm right before God? Well, I, I, see, everyone in one way or another, every human being will answer that question, right? Some people choose to answer, like you, you, everybody's got, let's say, a God problem, right? And everybody has to deal with the God problem. So the way some people deal with the God problem is to say, there is no God. So I'm an atheist or an agnostic and uh, because I'm not convinced, therefore I just won't believe. Now, the Bible says people who say there is no God, the Bible says you're a fool, the Bible says of those people that what can be known about God is plain to them because God has revealed it to them through his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. So the one who says there is no God will not stand before God someday and go, there was no proof. God will laugh. God will go, there was proof if you'd have looked at your hand. There was proof if you'd have looked at your cat. You could see the creation right before you. You have no excuse. Now, that's, that's some people. Not a lot of people, but some people. Other people go one of two ways. How do I know I'm right before God? How do I solve the God problem? Well, I prove my godliness by sort of building up my spiritual resume. 
right? I look and I say, man, I'll keep all these laws. I'll be a really good person. I'll make the good outweigh the bad, right? What we might call a moralist, somebody who thinks that by being moral and good and right, that's going to earn my favor with God. The other person says, well, I make up my own rules. I do my own thing. God is just sort of happy that I'm around and he's, he's good with me no matter what I do. And so as, as long as I sort of keep to my own code, whatever that is, it might be different than you, you than me, but, but God has to accept me. You might call that person a relativist, right? So, so these are sort of the, the, the paths. Paul's going to come along in Romans 10 and say, there's another way. There's the gospel. Okay, so, so, so look what he says. It's so beautiful. Look at verse 9. This is where I really want us to spend our time this morning. Verse 9, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Now look at me, right? This is, this is the unvarnished. This is the, the virgin territory. This is this beautiful reality that God puts in front of us. And this is why I started out at the beginning. There has been an invasive growth that has come up over that truth, over that verse, that I think threatens to choke out the reality, the beauty of what Paul is saying here. See, see um, this verse has been used and abused by people. This verse has been used to say something, you know, sort of teach an easy believism. All you got to do is decide for Jesus. All you got to do is then say, do you, do you confess him as Lord? Well, yes. And, and can you say that in front of a group? Yeah. Will you pray this prayer? Yes. And, and if you sort of follow this formula, then you're in. And, and by the way, just like the people who brought kudzu to the United States, they, they, weren't, they weren't trying to be evil. They weren't trying to damage things. They, they were well-intentioned folk. I think there's a good intention behind something like that. There's a good intention behind what we might call the sinner's prayer. Some of you would go, man, I, I got saved. Somebody led me in the sinner's prayer. But, but I'm afraid that has grown up over modern evangelicalism where we've got to take a step back and we've got to pull back the growth from that and look under and say, what, 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 did, what was really meant by that? See, is it really that easy? Is it just easy? All I got to do is get people to a crisis po point in their faith and then say, man, don't you want Jesus? Well, I think maybe I do. And okay, well, then I'll, I'll lead you in this prayer. And if you'll say this prayer, and if you'll really believe it, then you're a Christian. And, and again, I want you to hear my heart. The pastor's heart behind this series is not to throttle anybody in this room. It's to say, I, I, I can't imagine a worse scenario than believing I'm a Christian only to find out when I stand before God that I'm not. So hear me. I'm not raining on anybody's parade here. I'm not trying to make fun of you or anybody else. I'm saying this because this would be the worst, uh, this, this would be the most horrific thing that I think that could happen to anybody. And so I want to peel back the layers of that, right? I, I want to look at this again. Is it really all I've got to do is admit I'm a sinner, I can't save myself, believe Christ died for me, rose again, Ask him to come into my heart. And if I prayed that prayer sincerely, I'm a Christian. And now if I want to know if I'm a Christian, I look back to this event where I prayed some prayer. I walked some mile. I did this thing. And this is how I know. In fact, maybe even a pastor told me, you're a Christian. What does the Bible say? Isn't that what we want to know, right? Ultimately, whatever pronouncement I might have of your life is irrelevant it's what does the Bible say about what's real, okay? And this is what I want to get to in this, in this here. I, I want us to look at this verse and really look. See, see um, there's some great truths in the sinner's prayer. I, I, I want to say this. I, somebody led me in the sinner's prayer. There's good truths there. There's, but there's an abuse and a misuse of it that I'm afraid uh, that we've got to deal with. There are some real dangers, so, so let me give you some of the dangers, just really quickly, of the sinner's prayer. Number one, there's no biblical precedent for the sinner's prayer. None. You will never see Jesus. You'll never see an apostle. You'll never see anybody in Scripture ever saying, here's a prayer for you. Say this prayer, and you can be a Christian. No, nothing even like it, ever. 
Number two, you won't see that in church history. I'm talking about early church history. This is a very modern invention, right? That what you do is say this prayer and you're a Christian. So the early church fathers never knew anything of a certain uh, prayer that you would give, give to people. Number three, it reduces the gospel to a formula. Now, again, I think well-intentioned people well-intentioned pastors, well-intentioned evangelists have said, man, pray this prayer. But, but it makes the gospel into a formula. And hear me, there doesn't need to be any evidence for the reality of what you've prayed as long as you've prayed some prayer. That's a danger. Number four, it's replace Christ's invitation. I would say the biblical formula, if you want to know a formula, is repent and believe. That's what you see. Go to the book of Acts. Listen to Jesus. This is what you see. Repent. Turn from that. Believe this. That's the formula. This is what the Bible is after. Have you repented? Have you believed? Not did you ask Jesus into your heart. That's nowhere in Scripture. We can fight about Revelation later has nothing to do with that, okay? Number five, the sinner's prayer has become the primary basis for some people's assurance of faith. Now, this is where I'm most concerned. This kind of formulaic, whatever that was, sinner's prayer, walked an aisle, said something, you know, somebody, somebody sort of, you know, uh, uh, said over me that you're a Christian. It, 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 it gives you, this is what people are looking and saying, how do I know I'm a Christian? I pray to prayer. I don't need to see transformation. I don't need to see a difference in my life. I don't need to see ongoing fruit. Nobody ever told me that. I just need to see this. So if Paul in verse 9 of Romans 10 is not simply saying, hey, just confess and believe. That's all you got to do. Simple as that. If he's not saying that, what is he saying? Well, well let's, I mean, let, let me just say this. I, I think in summary, Paul is saying this. This is true. The belief, the confession, that is true the moment you're saved, but that continues to be true throughout your life. That is, that you are made right with God at the moment of salvation, absolutely true. Maybe even when you prayed some prayer. But, but the evidence that you're truly a Christian is that there will be an ongoing, right? there? You will continue to believe. You will continue to confess the rest of your life. See, we believe, and I believe this heartily, and I'll shout this from the rooftops, salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, for the glory of God alone. But faith, grace, salvation never stands alone. It's always accompanied by the evidence, by the fruit, the, the genuine, enduring confession of Christ's lordship all of your days. See, no, you don't want to say, what past event can I look to to assure myself that I'm saved, that I'm right with God? That's never the right question. You want to look and say, am I presently believing, confessing, manifesting Christ's lordship over my life? Listen to Paul Washer. He's an evangelist, and he says this, Genuine saving faith is validated by its perseverance and fruit. And the evidence that we have been saved from the condemnation of sin is that we are currently being saved from the power of sin. Now, we talked about this briefly last week, right? In other words, I can look at my life today, whether I've been a Christian for 50 years or, or five days, and I can say, I actually, like the power of sin, it's not gone, it's there, it's real, I fight it, but it's losing its grip slowly losing its grip on my life. Some things fall away immediately. Other things, we agonize, we strive with them, but I sense that they're, this, like it's losing its grip on my life. Do you see that? I'm talking about today. Not, not that happened five years ago, five days ago, 50 years ago. It's happening right now. So let, let's look at each of these sort of statements Paul makes in verse nine and just ask the question, what do they mean? Like what? So first of all, what is believing in your heart? What does that mean to say, if you believe in your heart? Well, uh, I mean, we talk about believing in all kinds of things, don't we? And it's so easy to believe. I believe, I really genuinely believe that two plus two is four. 
I really genuinely believe that there are pyramids in Egypt. I, am, I have this authentic belief in the law of gravity that I can't step off the edge of this stage without falling. I believe that in my heart. Is that what Paul means? Is that what's going on here? Totally convinced that something is true? You know, if you, if you go and read the Gospels, let's say the book of Mark, for example. The book of Mark, uh, a couple of times, Jesus runs into demons, like demonic possession inside of people. And the demons speak through these people. And the demons say things like, I know who you are, Jesus. You're the Holy One of God. He sees another demon later in Mark and it says, you, Jesus, are the Son of the Most High God. Demons believe in Jesus. Sincerely believe in Jesus. Authentically. Strong belief in who He is. And their belief doesn't save them. It condemns them. It condemns them. And again, I'm not thanking anybody. Don't think I'm judging you. I'm asking myself, like, am I like that? I think there's a lot of people who are like demons, who genuinely believe, they're convinced, they might confess that I believe that Jesus Christ, Son of the Most High God. But you look at their life, and there's no discernible fruit. Christ is not Lord. They have not been transformed. See, so Paul says, believe in your heart. So let's talk about that for a minute. The heart in Scripture, and we use it kind of the same way when we're really thinking about what it means to talk about the heart. The heart is like, I guess we could say, the real you. It's, it's the control center. It's the operating system. How do you want to think of this? Like it's the throne of your life. It's where everything flows out of what's happening to the heart. This is when he says, when he talks about the heart, this is what he means. It's, the, it's this place, it's the main driver of your life. So believe in your heart. In other words, if you do that, if you believe in your heart about Christ, you're saying he occupies the driver. He sits in the driver's seat. He's on the throne. He, he is at the controls of my life. He controls me. He's, he's everything to me. He's the center of my existence. I don't just believe a fact about him. This is, this is what's happening. So, so to, then he says, but if you believe in your heart, and he says, look at verse 9 again, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. Now, why does he say that? Is it just as simple as saying, I believe that Jesus Christ died and he rose from the dead on the third day? It's so easy to be glib about this. This is where we got to be careful. If you say you believe that God raised Jesus from the dead, biblically speaking, here's what Paul's saying. Now you're saying you believe everything that Jesus claimed about himself was true. You believe everything the Bible claims about Jesus is true. Like what? Let me just give you a sampling, okay? I'll do these quick. I think they'll probably be in your app if you need to see them. Number one, he's the eternal God and creator of the universe. The Bible says this about Jesus. He is the life and light of all men. He is humankind's only Savior. There is no other Savior. He is the absolute sovereign of the universe. He will determine the eternal destiny of every person. He is more valuable than the combined wealth of all the world. If you get the combined wealth of the world and you miss Jesus, you lose everything. He is to be loved above everyone and everything. He is to be followed and obeyed no matter the cost to you. He is the righteous judge of all mankind. He is the king of kings. He is the Lord of lords. Now we could go on and on. Here's what I want you to recognize about this list. You can't say that in your heart and yawn. You follow me? This is not a glib, he's the eternal son of God. He's the king of kings and lord of the lords. 
Paul is saying th- this is the operational center of your life. And if you really believe that, I mean, if that's the control center of your life, here's what I want you to hear. It will change you. You will not stay the same. It will transform every part of your life. Why? Because now you have a new control center. Now something has fundamentally shifted. Now you have a new Lord and master. See, see, proof of saving faith is not you prayed a prayer at a 1972 Billy Graham crusade. Fine if you did. Proof is if you really believe it, right? Since that moment of praying that prayer, hear me, Christ's claim on you and Christ's claims about himself have steadily grown in your life. Some of you probably read C.S. Lewis's Chronicles of Narnia. I forget which one it is. My kids will remind me, but there's, there's one where Lucy, the youngest of the Pevensey children, she's the one who first meets Aslan, sort of the Christ figure. And in one of the later stories, she meets him again. Oh, Aslan, she says, you've grown bigger. And he says, that's because you have. And as you grow, I'll grow. That's the idea. As you grow in your faith, as you grow in Christ, as you progressively move through the Christian life, Jesus should not become smaller. He should occupy more space. He should occupy more lordship. He should be a greater master. He should be moving into areas of your life you didn't even know were there and saying, that's mine. He's bigger. He lays claim to your entire world, entire world view. Now, that's what believing in your heart, what, is, what does he mean by confess with your mouth? If you confess with your mouth. Now, here again, right? Just like belief. I can say that. I can confess whatever. I might even believe it. What is is Paul talking about? Notice the confession. What do we confess with our mouth? Look at it. Jesus is Lord. Not, hear me, I believe in Jesus. That's great. I hope you do. It's Jesus is Lord. In other words, I confess outwardly. What's happened with the belief in my heart is that now I confess that Christ has absolute lordship over my life. The evidence that inward faith is real is that outward faith is confessed. Um, The visible fruit is, that you are living for a new master is, is, is looking at your life. See, does your life show that? Now, I know we, we don't call people Lord. And maybe that's a good thing, right? They, you know, old English is kind of Lord so-and-so. They, they still do that, but like we, we don't. And so in some ways this feels foreign to us. But, but somehow we got to grapple with the meaning of that. Lord, master, sovereign, king, ruler, boss, whatever word does it for you, whatever locks it in as this is the one who's absolutely sovereign, who takes first place, who gets to tell me what to do and what not to do. That's lordship of Jesus. So that word is fine. You confess that. You believe that. See, see, I could ask you, can you say Jesus is Lord? One time Jesus asked his disciples, um, Mark chapter 10 again, he asked them and says, can you, can you drink the cup I'm going to drink, be baptized with the baptism I'm going to be baptized with? And Mark or, uh, John uh, says to him, James and John say, sure, why not? Yeah, we're good. That's kind of how we treat Jesus as Lord. Can you say that? Sure, no problem. See, if I say that to you, that doesn't hit you at all in a strange way. Let, let me, somehow, I, I gotta figure this out. How, how, how would you have felt if you were the Roman Christians, Roman Jews that Paul is writing to? First of all, you're in Rome. Second of all, you're ruled by an emperor. You know them. We call them Caesars, right? You've studied the Caesars in school. 
And this is a rising tide that's happening in this time when Paul is writing of what was called emperor worship. Caesar worship. So that it was very common that if there was any doubt in anybody's mind about where your loyalty and fealty arose, then they would simply say to you, an official would come with a sword in hand, I want you to confess, and there's one Lord in this world, the one that you will obey, and that is Caesar. In fact, they had a, 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 a term for it. Curios Caesar. Lord Caesar, or Caesar Curios Caesar is Lord. This is the Roman audience that's hearing Paul say this. Confess Jesus is Lord. Do you understand? That's treasonous. You understand that you don't glibly go about saying Jesus is Lord. No, no Roman Gentile would do that. No Roman Jew would do that. I'm a Roman Jew who now believes that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And Paul is saying, say Jesus is Lord. I'm a Jew. I believe there is one Lord and one God, and it's Jehovah. I'm a monotheist, right? So if I'm to say Jesus is Lord, what I'm saying is that Christ is co-equal with God. These are massive statements. You understand? Here's what I'm trying to help you hear. It's not a glib thing to say Jesus is Lord. Listen to A.T. Robertson. He's a, he's a New Testament scholar, and he says this. No Jew would do this, would say this confession, who had not really trusted Christ for kurios, that's Lord, in the Greek translation of the Old Testament, that's Septuagint, is used of God. No Gentile would do it who had not ceased worshiping the emperor as Lord, as kurios. One is reminded of the demand made to Polycarp that he say to say Kurios Caesar in, uh, and, and how each time he replied Kurios Jesus, Jesus is Lord. They wanted him to say, say Caesar is Lord. No, Jesus is Lord. He paid the penalty for his loyalty with his life. Light-hearted men today can say Lord Jesus in a flippant or even in an irreverent way, but no Jew or Gentile then said it who did not mean it. We don't just spout this off. These are not mere words. You understand that? Christ said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So there is a continuity between what I say I believe in my heart and what comes out of my mouth and out of my life. See, see um, we live in a culture right now that says, okay, it's okay if you love Jesus in your heart, just don't bring it up. Just don't live it out. Do you understand, biblically speaking, that's not possible. You can't say, I love Jesus in my heart, but it never comes out outwardly. That's a false faith. There's no such, you're not a Christian. But you can't do the opposite either. You can't say, man, there's no real, I confess him outwardly. Oh, Jesus is Lord. But truly, inwardly, the control center of my life is me. There's no Jesus sitting upon that throne. I don't believe in my heart. He doesn't control me in that way. Then, then you have an empty faith. You have a faith of mere words. See, see, see this is simple. It's confess and believe. As long as we can agree what confession means and what believe means. If you've truly done that, you're a Christian. If not, you're not. See, see root, being rooted in Christ is not I have a casual connection to Him. Being rooted in anything isn't a casual connection, isn't it? My tomato plant at home isn't casually connected to the soil. It's not going to live without it, Right? It's, 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 it's not what's happening here, right? It's, it's, there's a realistic view of who I am that causes me to turn from my sin and turn in faith to Christ. It's an, now an inward belief that says Christ is the center of my life. And hear me, do, do any of us who are Christians live out this perfectly? Obviously not. 
But man, Christ is the filter. He's the worldview, the gospel. It's, it's, what, it's what I process everything with. Can somebody look at your life? Would somebody at work, would a neighbor, would a family member that knew you before Christ and now sees you after look and say, maybe I don't even know what's going on, but you're different. Like, you have a whole new set of priorities. There's something totally different about you. You believe in your heart. You confess with your mouth. Your inward belief now sits at the center of your life. Listen, Christians through the centuries have believed this. This is, this is pulling back the undergrowth, right, the overgrowth, and looking underneath and saying what Christians have always believed until maybe the mid-18th century or 19th century has been that your faith will actually change who you are. It will transform your life. Uh, some of you know the name Jordan Peterson. Right? He's got 12 Rules of Life, like international bestseller. He did a recent podcast basically discussing, do you believe in God? And he's really, really hesitant to say it. And I got to appreciate his intellectual honesty because he's like, am I a Christian? Am I not? Because he says, as soon as I say that, if I'm going to profess, here's a guy that as far as I know, he's an evolutionary psychologist that had no faith background. I don't know his background, but here's a guy who had not claimed anything but says, if I'm going to claim that I'm a Christian, if I'm going to claim that I believe in God in some way, that lays claim to my life. It's not a casual thing. Is that you? Has Jesus Christ laid hold of you? Laid claim to your life. So now he is the greatest priority. He is your Lord and Master. He is at the control center of your life. Have you repented? Have you believed? Have you, as we've defined it, confessed with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believed in your heart that he's raised from the dead? It's simple and profound. And if you believe that, you will be saved. Let's pray. Father, uh, Lord, that's my prayer. That's my prayer for me, God. I don't want to preach this sermon and not evaluate from my own heart and life. Is this true of me? Do I see the present reality of Christ, of believing and confessing today? And where I have grown cold, Father, I pray, warm my heart again to the truth. Help me again to see you, to understand, to obey you as Lord for all that you are. God, I, I pray for my friends here today. If there's those like me who maybe at one point look back and say, man, I've, I profess to be a Christian. I just don't live like it. That God, today would be a turning point. Maybe some of them would say, I've never... I've never really believed in my heart that leads to the confession with my mouth of living this out, but today would be that day, God. So, Spirit of God, I'm, I'm helpless without you right now to do what only you can do, to awaken minds, to give sight to the blind, to give hearing to the deaf, to raise the dead, to pull out a heart of stone and put in a heart of flesh. But I pray, I plead with you, do that right now. That maybe there are those that would go from darkness to light. Maybe there are those who would say, man, I've, I've thought for years that because I prayed some prayer, walked some mile, because a priest or pastor pronounced that over me that I was saved and now they hear. And I pray it would not just be the thud of dread, God, it would be a glory of joy that would say, thank you for opening my eyes so that they could see and believe. So do that in this room. Do that at Foothill Church today, we pray. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So listen, if I just prayed for you, I don't have a formula for you to go through. I just want to simply say this. We would love to pray with you and for you, come alongside you in any way we can. So if you just prayed, if you're in that moment where you say, I'm t I want to turn from my sin and believe in Jesus, I want, I want to do this.
after the second applause, you guys will come up. A way that we can. Or together. So suffer.
today. Yeah. Well, good morning, Foothill Church. Uh, it's great to be here with you this morning. Is this working? How about now? Oh. All right. I'll just talk really loud. Good morning, Foothill Church. Can you hear me? All right. Well, this is a great illustration of what uh, Chris was just talking about, this, this ability to confess and believe uh, that Jesus is Lord. And there is this private and personal part of that, that we, we do that internally and we believe that and we make that decision on our own. But there's this other neat part that gets to be public, that we get to share and we get to say, church, family, come alongside us. And I want you to know that I believe this. And that's what we get to do today. We get to give hands and feet uh, to what we just talked about making. And so if, if you just made that decision this morning to believe and confess in the, in the Lord Jesus Christ, baptism is a wonderful step because we get to celebrate. And we have five amazing stories today of people who want to get baptized. And so um, I just want to say they're doing this because they love the Lord, they believe in him, and they want you to know that they love the Lord and believe in him. And they're asking you to pray, to come alongside them and join them as their church family to help them grow in this. So we have everything from a new believer two months ago to someone who was baptized as an infant um, and just said, hey, I want to make this decision publicly now today. So I'm going to introduce you to the people getting baptized. And your job this morning is to keep them in prayer and then to, just to cheer for them when they come up out of the water because it's celebrating the new life in Christ that they have and they're excited about. So thanks. Thanks, Travis. All right. Hey, well, good job, everyone. All right. <laughs> this is Joe and Christina, and they're married. Uh, it's so cool that they get to share this day of uh, baptism. So, uh, Josh, I have a few questions for you, all right? all right? Have you recognized your need for a Savior? Yes. And is it your desire to follow Jesus Christ for the rest of your life? Yes. And are you trusting in his death on the cross for the forgiveness of your sins? Yes. Well, based on that confession, it's my privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Be buried in likeness of his death. Be raised in new life. Congratulations, Joe. Thanks, Mark. All right, Christina, your turn. All right, Christina. Have you recognized your need for a Savior? Yes. And are you trusting in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins? Yes. And do you want to follow him for the rest of your life? Yes. Well, based on that confession, it is my privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Be buried in likeness of his death. Be raised in new life. Congratulations, guys. What a great day. Come on in, Karina. All right, this is Will and Karina. They're also married and celebrating baptism on the same day. So why don't you step forward just a little bit? All right. Yeah, why don't you go to her side? It'll be, yeah, all right. Karina, let me ask you a few questions. Have you recognized your need for a Savior? Yes. And are you trusting in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins? Yes. And do you want to follow him for the rest of your life? Yes. I know you do. Well, based on that testimony, it's my privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father, why don't you cover your name? Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Be buried in likeness of his death, be raised in new life. Congratulations. Yeah. Come on over here, Will. Why don't you speed up a little bit? All right, Will, we've got those same questions for you. Have you recognized your need for a Savior? Yes. And are you trusting in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins? Yes. And is it your desire to follow him for the rest of your life? Yes. Well, based on that confession, it's my privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Be buried in likeness of his death. Be raised in new life. Congratulations. Thanks, guys. All right, we got one last baptism, and it's Chris. And uh, it's been cool getting to know Chris and seeing how, how he's growing. But he just hurt his back at work, and he didn't want to miss baptism today. So we have to, we're going to baptize him a little bit different way. But um, we're so great, great we get to celebrate and um, share this with you, all right? So, Chris, have you recognized your need for a Savior? Yes. And is, do you want to follow Jesus for the rest of your life? Yes. And are you trusting in him for the forgiveness of your sin? Yes. Well, based on that testimony, it's my privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Be buried in likeness of his death. Be raised in your life. 
Congratulations. Good, good job. I was like, okay, I'm really bad at turning on mics. I was like, what happened to that? Yeah, it's, you did good, yeah. Because <laughs> I was like, I suck. <laughs> was like, no. No, okay. it was great. That was okay. actually easy, really easy. Okay, yeah. 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 Travis came to the rescue anyway, so it's all good. No, what?